Hello, and welcome back to the Pediatric Foundational Series here on the Dietitians and Nutrition Support Channel. My name is Allison Lawrence, and I'm a pediatric dietitian in Southern California, and I'm also a certified nutrition support clinician. And I am your host for our foundational series where we discuss all things pediatrics. In today's video, we're going to be discussing neonatal access points from both an enteral nutrition as well as a parenteral nutrition standpoint. It's really important to be able to understand the type of access that your patient has so you know the type of nutrition that you're able to provide, as well as being able to understand what you might potentially need to advocate for in terms of access placement for your patient so you can ensure optimal nutrient delivery. First, we'll begin with discussing enteral access. And in general, enteral access, very similar to adult and pediatric patients, is divided into short-term enteral access and long-term enteral access. Short-term access points include our oral gastric tubes or OG tubes, nasal gastric tubes or NG tubes, as well as nasal jejunal tubes or NJ tubes. Oral gastric tubes are going to be inserted through the mouth. They go down the esophagus where the tip of the tube is going to terminate within the stomach. Oral gastric tubes are preferentially utilized for patients that are less than 34 weeks gestational age, as these infants are obligatory nose breathers, meaning that they breathe through their nose, so we don't want to potentially obstruct the nasal passage, make it a little bit more difficult for them to be able to breathe. Oral gastric tubes are indicated for patients with a normal functioning GI tract. We then have our nasogastric tubes, or NG tubes, and these are the most common type of tube that you'll see placed within the NICU setting. These are inserted through the nose, they go down the esophagus, past the lower esophageal sphincter where the tip of the tube will terminate within the stomach. These tubes are also indicated for patients with a normal functioning GI tract. We then have nasal jejunal tubes or NJ tubes, and these tubes are utilized for patients that might potentially be able to have some aspects that are affecting gastric function. So potentially patients that are having frequent emesis that's impacting their growth and development, or patients that potentially have any gastrointestinal malformation or anomaly that we can be able to have a transpyloric tube placed past the default area so we can still be able to feed from an enteral nutrition standpoint. Nasal jejunal tubes are inserted through the nose. They go down the esophagus, through the stomach, past the pyloric sphincter where the tip is going to terminate within the intestine. Oftentimes, these can be placed by trained staff at bedside or are sometimes preferentially placed in interventional radiology. We then have our long-term enteral access devices, and these include G-tubes or gastrostomy tubes, J-tubes or jejunostomy tubes, and then our GJ tubes or gastrojejunostomy tubes. Gastrostomy tubes are the most common type of long-term enteral access device that is placed within a neonatal patient, and this can be placed in a variety of different ways. One of the ways that we can place gastrostomy tubes is percutaneously, so we call this a PEG tube or percutaneously endoscopically placed gastrostomy, and this is with the use of an endoscope via the push or the pull method. Gastrostomy tubes can also be surgically placed as well. We then have our jejunostomy tubes or our J-tubes, and these are commonly placed for the same reason that an NJ tube would be placed. These can also be placed percutaneously or be surgically placed as well. We then have our gastrojejunostomy tubes or our GJ tubes, and these really serve a dual function. So they allow us to be able to feed within the intestines while still being able to have access to the stomach. So this might be helpful for patients that we can vent their stomach, so being able to let out some air, or for medications that might potentially still need to have gastric absorption, we can also provide meds through the G port and still feed through the J port. We will now move into talking about parenteral access. So parenteral nutrition access can generally be divided into peripheral and central access. For peripheral access, the reasons why neonatal patients would require peripheral parenteral nutrition is sometimes just while we're waiting for a placement for a central line, or can also be used as supplemental nutrition to a patient that is on some aspect of an enteral nutrition feeding. PPN is recommended to be utilized for no longer than 7 to 10 days and does have maximum osmolarity constraints of 800 to 900 milliosmoles per liter per Aspen's recommendations. So this might equate to about a 12.5% maximum of dextrose percentage. However, it's going to depend on what else you're putting within your TPN solution. So how much amino acids you have, how much electrolytes you have, as well as the total amount of fluid that you're allotted. Peripheral access is obtained by inserting into a peripheral vein, and those peripheral veins have a lower rate of blood flow flowing through them, 
So this is why we cannot provide high osmolarity because this does have the potential to increase the risk for phlebitis. We have different types of peripheral access points. The first is going to be a peripheral arterial line or a PAL line. So a PAL line is inserted into a peripheral artery, and this is not utilized to provide nutrition, but it is used to be able to obtain labs and blood gases. So you might be thinking, well, why are we talking about it if it's not used to provide nutrition? But what we do have going through this line is we do have fluids that are running through there. So we need to have some sort of fluid running in order to be able to keep that catheter patent. So this is called often called a TKO fluid or to keep open fluid. So it might be something like normal saline or sodium acetate running at half an ml to one ml per hour. And while 24 mls in a 24 hour period might not necessarily be significant to an older kid or an older adult, for a neonate that weighs about one to two or even three kilograms, that can make a large difference in their total fluid provision for the day. So you wanna make sure that you're aware of what type of line access you have as well as the fluids that are running through those lines. We then have our peripheral IV and these are inserted into peripheral veins commonly within the hands or the feet and can be utilized to provide PPN. We also have midlines. So midlines are inserted into the upper portion of the arm, most commonly in the basilic or the brachial vein. And the tip of this catheter is still going to terminate below the axilla. So sometimes um, many people might debate on whether a midline is a central type of axis or peripheral, but it's still peripheral because it's terminating below the axilla and doesn't terminate into a central vein. So it should be utilized in order to provide PPN. We then have our central types of access points. So neonates have a couple of different access points than adult patients. And this is because following birth, we do have access to the umbilical cord stump. So in utero, the umbilical cord has two arteries and one vein. Following birth, that umbilical cord is cut and we're left with a stump. And we can be able to utilize this in order to obtain IV access. So one of the lines that you might see placed in the umbilical cord stump is called a UAC or an umbilical arterial catheter. And these are used for the same reasons that a PAL line or a peripheral arterial line might be utilized. So we can be able to obtain blood gases as well as draw laps from them. And they're important to remember because you're gonna have that to keep open fluid or the TKO fluid running through there. So you wanna make sure that you're considering that when you're looking at your overall fluid provision. We then have our UVCs, which are our umbilical venous catheters. And so these are going to be inserted into the umbilical vein in the umbilical cord stump. They go through the umbilical vein past the ductus venosus, where the tip is going to terminate in the inferior vena cava right below the right atrium. So these are considered to be central types of access points and can be utilized to provide central parenteral nutrition. However, you always wanna make sure that you're confirming placement of this line with your team. So sometimes UVCs might be what we call low-lying UVCs, and that means that they're not fully reaching that IVC right atrium junction. So therefore, um, that, that tip of that catheter might be terminating in the ductus venosus somewhere, and so we would treat that UVC that's low-lying as a peripheral line, and so we would write for PPN. The types of patients that you would potentially see with UVCs and UACs are per McMaster's recommendations, and this includes all infants that are less than 28 weeks gestational age, or infants that are older than that, but are potentially on mechanical ventilation with high FiO2 requirements, those that are considered to be hemodynamically unstable as well. Typically, UVCs and UACs are not placed in any patient that has a specific gastrointestinal malformation, such as gastroschisis or embolocele. We then have our PIC lines. So PIC lines are peripherally inserted central catheters, and they're inserted into peripheral veins, and they're threaded up past the upper portion of the arm, where the tip will terminate either in the superior vena cava, or you can also have PIC lines that are placed from down below, and those will terminate into the tip of the inferior vena cava. PIC lines can be utilized in order to provide central parenteral nutrition, and this is the most common type of central access that you'll see placed in a neonatal patient. We then have our CVCs, and CVCs are central venous catheters. These are commonly placed in neonatal patients that we're looking for more of a long-term type of central access. So this might be for a patient that might be going home from the NICU on home TBN, where we really need to have a secure form of access that's also a little bit of a lower risk of infection. 
So CVCs that are tunneled are considered to be a little bit lower risk because you have a different entrance point for the catheter and a different exit point. And finally, we do have ports. So ports are a little bit rare for placement in the neonatal patient, but ports can be potentially placed for neonates with an oncological diagnosis. So this might be helpful in order to be able to provide high potency medications such as chemotherapy. That concludes our video for today where we talked about neonatal access points. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them in the comment section below. And stay tuned to the Dietitians and Nutrition Support channel where we discuss further episodes and different topics in pediatrics. Mm -hmm.